Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our conversation today on the global landscape of government outcomes funds. I am Danielle Logue, and I'm the Director of the Centre for Social Impact here at the University of New South Wales. As we begin today, I would firstly and importantly like to acknowledge the Bejigal people of the Eora Nation, upon whose lands the university stands, and importantly for us to recognise them as the traditional custodians of knowledge of these lands. I would like to give my thanks and pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders, past and present, and also recognise that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. It's also a very important time in Australia, and I'd like to just note here the Centre for Social Impact's full support for the yes vote for the upcoming referendum and affirm our support also for the Uluru Statement from the Heart and there's further details and resources available on our website. Now, today's session, we have a 30-minute conversation with a little bit of time for Q&A at the end of our conversation. You can actually post your questions using the Q&A function on Zoom, and you can also vote for particular questions. So we'll try and get to the most popular ones at the end of our conversation too. And as you can see, we're also recording this conversation, and that will be made available. Uh, later on this week as well. Now, I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Eleanor Carter, who is the Research Director at the University of Oxford's Government Outcomes Lab, also known as the Go Lab, which I think is a fantastic name, Eleanor, by the way. Uh, Eleanor also is, uh, as well as being an experienced researcher, is previously an advisor to the UK Cabinet Office in social finance and impact investing as well. And we're very keen to speak uh, with Eleanor, given her work and research on government outcomes funds globally, and particularly given the timing here in Australia with the Australian federal government's announcement and commitment to a $100 million government outcomes fund. We're really keen, given the years of experience at the Centre for Social Impact in outcomes measurement and evaluation, to think about what are some of the global trends, the lessons that we might draw on in design and implementation uh, that's happening globally in these outcomes funds too. And I'd personally like to thank Eleanor uh, very much for waking up so early on a Monday morning as well to join us too. Now, we've got um, a couple of slides here that might form the background of our conversation as well as we move along, uh, just as a reference point. But Eleanor, I wonder just to kick it, kick us off if you could share with us, you know, what's what's the purpose or the mission of the Government Outcomes Lab in general? Thanks, Danielle. Hi, everyone. It's really great to be with you today. Um, so the, the Go Lab is a research centre based at the Blavatnik School of Government in the University of Oxford. And we investigate how governments partner with the private and social sectors to improve social outcomes. Um, and I think there are three things about the GoLab that I'd like to share with you today. Um, there's something about our purpose and our lens. So we do produce academic work, but we often decide, describe ourselves as a bridge to government. So our research is really geared to helping government partner better. And the mission and question that guides us is, is about that, is about how can government be a better partner, particularly when using an outcomes focus to foster effective cross-sector partnerships to tackle some really persistent social challenges. And secondly, something about kind of who we aspire to be. We aspire to be neutral and trusted in the way that we do our work. And um, I think it's really important that we're not, we're not a market player uh, and we're actually agnostic on the types of tools um, in terms of the partnership models that we're looking at here. Um, we were established as a partnership between the University of Oxford and British government in response to an acknowledgement that the debates around social impact bonds or social benefit bonds for you guys, that the debate was very polarised between the believers and the critics, and it lacked nuance and evidence. Um, so we'd really try to be a trusted convener and put emphasis on growing the quality and quantity of evidence around these different tools. And thirdly, just something about our approach and our ethos. Uh, we really believe in building public assets like open access data sets to kind of crowd in other research, other questions um, being applied to these tools. Um, and we really want to work in dialogue with practitioners. So we certainly don't know everything about these tools and we really try to work with a spirit of 
humility and curiosity to bring different um, different partners together. So policy teams, delivery organisations for collective learning and sharing as we go. Um, so, so thanks. It's really great to um, to be able to draw on some of the GoLab's um, collaborative research projects to inform the conversation today. No, we really appreciate it, and I've always been a a long term uh, inspired actually by the GoLab's work and that serious commitment to producing data for the public good and open access. There, so it's fantastic work that you're driving on multiple fronts. I wonder if we could cover just to start off with our conversation here, just some of the basics about outcomes <laughs> funds. Uh, what are they? What are you seeing? What's the, what's their role? Sure. Um, so I think outcomes funds are being touted as the solution to taking outcomes based contracting. Uh, to scale, so including things that like impact bonds and social benefit bonds, but this focus on outcomes in the partnership between government and delivery organisations, making that more widespread. Um, at present, there aren't really any standard definitions for what we're talking about here. There seems to be quite a lot of variation in the way these things have been worked up, and there aren't many mature examples um, but they seem to be important. Um, over the past few years, we've started tracking their use. Um, and particularly in the UK landscape, the vast majority of impact bond projects have been incubated through these things called outcomes funds. Um, so let me let me pull up some notes in terms of how um, how we define them. And, and this is like a working definition for us. So we think there are three parts. This is dedicated funding to pay for social outcomes. Uh, so rather than inputs or activities, this is this is money to pay for, for, the, for the long range outcomes uh, achieved through a particular project. Um, there's an expectation that several different outcomes based contracts or partnerships will result. So multiple things that have an outcomes flavor will, will be um, introduced as the result of the outcomes fund. And then the third part is a little bit more um, flexible. We suggest that they might be open to the involvement of impact investments, although they can be varied in how they do this. Certainly some of the UK projects have been quite, uh, the UK outcomes funds have been quite strict in the requirements for the involvement of impact investment as the working capital to back these projects. Elsewhere, there's been a bit more flexibility. These need to be outcomes-based contracts, but the working requirement, uh, the requirement for working capital could be managed differently by the project partners. So there's less um, specificity in some outcomes funds around that. But they really seem to share this goal to improve services that tackle complex social issues by growing the outcomes contracting market. Um, so you can think of it like a, a canopy, I suppose, a canopy commitment to pay for outcomes. Um, actually, I'm struggling to move the, the slide on. Um, there we go. Great. So it's this this canopy structure with multiple outcomes based partnerships hanging off the bottom and they could be impact bonds or social benefit bonds or they could be just an outcomes um, focused contract. Um, and we do we do have a guide um, that we've worked up with some practitioners to kind of give the, the fundamentals um, and I can share a link to to that um, after the session. That would be terrific. Thank you. Um, but I just, um, I suppose one of the things that really strikes us is that there's a lot of expectations around this model. Um, so they get loaded up with lots of promises and um, maybe around three themes. So there's one around um, reducing transaction costs. So market building um, by making it easier. So kind of reducing the time, the cost and complexity of creating these outcomes based contracts. I think there's a theme around public sector reform, sort of improving public sector efficiencies under this kind of doing more with less agenda. Uh, and out, some outcomes funds are really geared to that. And then another theme that comes through is this, this link to evidence-based policy making. So um, some outcomes funds place, a, um, given that there's live data on the achievement of outcomes, this creates a very dynamic learning environment uh, for implementation. So this idea that outcomes funds can accelerate the learning about uh, an innovation around a particularly effective social interventions, or indeed learning about the outcomes based partnership model, um, more generally, this idea of a sort of a living lab of experimentation and live learning. 
I would agree. There's certainly a lot of great expectations around uh, the announcement of the federal government's commitment to a federal government fund um, here as well. You've got some uh, insights as well around kind of understanding the scale of, of outcomes funds and their potential um, as well. What are you finding there from your research? Yeah, so are you guys with a hundred million um, dollar outcomes fund? That would actually be one of the largest that we've seen so far internationally. But I think there's different ways of understanding scale um, that might have implications for the type of projects that are supported through each outcomes fund. So obviously we've got this top line in terms of the value of committed outcomes funding. But what does that mean for the value of individual contracts? Are we pursuing lots of small um, pilot programs? Are we looking for the, for the larger um, outcomes-based partnerships? What does that mean for the number of individual outcomes contracts? Also, if this is about market building and market development, there might be, be thoughts around how to involve a larger number of different stakeholders, perhaps who don't have familiarity with this model. One of the things that I think is interesting is that some of the outcomes funds that we've seen so far have an explicit sort of crowding in mandate. So there needs to be another outcomes funder, a different part of government, maybe a different um, federal agency or a different local government entity who co-pays for outcomes alongside the initially announced outcomes fund. So that might expand the number of contractual stakeholders. So what about the number of people who we're looking to support here? Are we thinking about long range and very um, intensive support for a smaller number of program participants? Or we think thinking about something um, larger, but maybe lighter to touch in terms of the type of programs that we're looking at. And it's, it's really interesting to see, I guess, the, the convergence and, and well, I guess bringing to the, the forefront the differences in our understandings of scale. We're curious, of course, to look at what that global landscape might be and what you're saying of things popping up. I, I'd probably say many of us on the call are uh, familiar perhaps with their policy diffusion path that often uh, comes from the UK to Australia as well. So how would you describe the evolving global landscape of the global um, of government outcomes funds? Sure. So we've actually started compiling an outcomes fund directory uh, with our, our data stewards. Um, and I can pop a link to that outcomes fund directory um, it out for, for you to, to have a look at the underlying data. Um, we've actually just updated it. And so I need to rerun this map with uh, <laughs> with your with your fund. But the, the UK certainly has um, the largest number with 10 um, instances of outcomes funds, but actually they're quite widespread across both kind of high income countries and lower and middle income country contexts. So there are other European examples, but we also see instances in Ghana and Sierra Leone and newly in South Africa. Um, the US actually only has one uh, example as far as we know um, so far, um, which is referred to as CIPRA. Um, but that, that, that outcomes fund is interesting and is particularly linked to this kind of evidence-based policy making agenda. They have particularly high bar in terms of the uh, evidence and evaluation requirements for the projects that that fund supports. That's and, really helpful. Yeah, and, and we're keen to know, um, it's interesting to see that geographic distribution, but also any trends that you might be picking up too. Yeah, sure. Um, so in terms of scale, they're, they're all less than 120 million US dollars. Um, so that these things are not enormous as, as far as we as we see it. Um, interestingly, though, all of the funds that are larger than 50 million US dollars require these co-commissioners. So there's not a single outcomes fund. It's trying to crowd in multiple payers for outcomes. Um, one of the other things that we see is that the funds that are around kind of 20 to 50 million are quite specific in terms of the population or the social issue that they're, they're trying to support and respond to. Um, so you can see down the left, this is a kind of the list of examples when we compiled them um, last year, um, different um, outcomes funds around the world. You can see their scale. There are quite a few smaller <laughs> outcomes funds. So there are a number that are less than 20 million. Um, so these are used as sort of um, test, test case or, right. or pilot schemes. Um, there isn't really much of a clear trend over time in terms of whether they're getting larger. Um, but I would say that this, the smaller funds do tend to be a little bit more specific 
specific in terms of the social issue area that they're targeting. So, for example, um, thinking about supporting young people who are at risk of homelessness or um, schemes for people who are disconnected from the labour market. Within that as well, in addition to the specific, say, social issue, are there any that are popping up that also have a focus on, say, certain place-based investment models as well, a certain geograph- a smaller geographic area? Yeah, so some have been operated at a kind of regional or a provincial right. level. Um, so that the um, the example from Netherlands just applies to one of the provinces that particularly wanted to run an innovation program bringing social investors, uh, they pro- provide a sort of matchmaking function actually alongside the um, outcomes funding contribution and technical support, I think is something that maybe I haven't mentioned so far, but is an important piece to the outcomes fund picture. And a lot of these initiatives aren't just a commitment to pay for outcomes. Um, they also bring online um, guidance or technical support to help project teams work in a, in a slightly different way and by taking that outcomes orientation in their work. And you're also looking at um, in the evaluation of the funds, I guess, some of the issues around the design choices, perhaps, or any other, any, any trends in the, the design of, of the funds that you might be seeing? Yeah, so, so this is something that um, we find that there's enormous variation, actually, in terms of the funds, in terms of how they're designed. So I'd really say that they're not one singular tool or approach. Outcomes funds are, are no one thing. There are a range of different frameworks um, that have been adopted. One of the ways that we can think about this is sort of unpacking the key design choices that are faced by uh, the fund administration team and their partners. So thinking around kind of the what, how specific are these funds in terms of the policy area, uh, the outcome measures that are, the, that are being um, sort of catalyzed through the model? And there's a question of who, how tightly prescribed or how flexible are these the ultimate projects in terms of who they're aiming to support? Sometimes this is almost down to a kind of a named list of people who are really known to be long term rough sleepers in a particular city. That's the group of people who the outcome funds have aimed to support in some instances. Elsewhere, it's been much more flexible and up to the project teams. So that kind of the the who question is, is quite important and can be tackled in different ways. How much? There are different approaches to outcomes pricing. And uh, the the evaluation of the achievement of outcomes has been tackled in different ways um, relating to this kind of when question as sort of when do we understand the outcomes to have been achieved and what kind of uh, verification or evidence bar are we applying to the achievement of those outcomes? That also varies a lot, too. And then the sort of who, excuse me, or, or who with question Are we requiring investors to be involved? Do we also have an expectation of evaluation partners on these projects? Again, that varies a lot across the different um, examples of outcomes funds that we see. So I might just try and illustrate this this variation. We, um, on on the kind of policy area um, and outcome measures piece, just with two quick examples, if that's okay. Um, So, in in this space, there is a sort of a, a rule based approach to inviting applications that's been pursued by some outcome funds administrators. So they tightly define the policy area or the policy challenge and the outcomes measures and set out a prescribed set of specific outcome metrics that can be used by the resultant projects. So here on the left of the slide, there's an example of uh, what's called the outcomes rate card from the Innovation Fund in the UK. So this is a a menu of of highly specific outcome metrics that were set out in advance of inviting proposals. um, And then pairs of investors and service providers were invited to bid in, much like a conventional public procurement process. So issue a menu run a procurement it's all quite specific and the prices or the maximum willingness to pay is set in advance Uh, so you can imagine that this reduces the transaction costs uh, because a lot of the work has been done and we've got this kind of replication effect actually doesn't give so much flexibility for the project teams on the ground to define what's important how we understanding success there's much less scope for that in this type of outcomes fund (laughs) 
we have examples that are much um, more flexible, maybe more principle based in terms of defining the policy focus. Um, so perhaps projects needed to think about three sustainable development goals and the, and the intersection between these. So health well-being, inequality, and decent work. This example comes from this, the very small Netherlands uh, pro, uh, Outcomes Fund in Nord-Brabant. Um, <clears throat> actually, in the UK, the Life Chances Fund is more of an example of this principle-based approach. There are very um, sort of loose uh, policy thematics announced for that fund, but then actually local project teams are able to be much more uh, propositional in terms of the type of issues that they want to respond to and the type of metrics to use. So these outcome measures are defined locally and then much more varied across projects in terms of the outcome measures uh, and the focus. So it's difficult to say where they're working best because they're, they're clearly um, such different beasts. Sorry, Daniel. No, no, absolutely. And uh, I'm curious to know your you and your team have also involved in some of the evaluation work of some of the outcomes funds uh, in the UK. You mentioned the Life Chances uh, Fund there. I wondered if you could share with us any of the, <clears throat> the early findings there that's coming out of uh, that one. Yeah, sure. So the Life Chances Fund is one of these sort of more more flexible co-funding for outcomes initiatives. <clears throat> and um, one of the things to note is um, that the variation across the resultant outcomes based projects. So we have sort of everything from um, projects focused on children who are in statutory care to support them to live um, lives that are kind of well connected to their families and do well in school. Others that are more about elder care and um, healthy aging. Others still that are about um, entry to work managing mental health conditions there's a very um, diverse set of projects which actually from a kind of learning and evaluation perspective can make it quite challenging to think about reading across best practice when there's such variation so um there are a few things that we've sort of adopted in our in our research and, and work to try and enable that to, to happen um one of the things that we've done is try to strike a real long term collaboration between the policy team who design and administer the outcomes fund um, and, and the research team. So we collaboratively work on research questions and have very active and uh, iterative approach to how we're tackling and responding to those, thinking about different data coming in at different times and, and being really dynamic in that. Um, the, the second piece. Um, is around sort of this data stewardship question. So one of the things we found when we began was that there was really very little standardized information in the public domain. People would ask us questions about project performance and we simply didn't know. We couldn't answer those questions because the data was so fragmented, definitions were open to interpretation. We found that no single organization owned the data or felt that they owned and were able to release the data. So we try to work more as a community in order to unlock these data and insights. And that's something that we've really worked with on the Life Chances Fund. So we think <laughs> we're aiming to release data in September for close to live project performance. So you'll be able to see which project has achieved what kind of outcome over time and how many people they've supported with what level of success. Um, so we think that's really exciting, but quite unusual <laughs> in terms of that level of granularity. Um, but we think that that can really support others because then when someone's thinking about another project that is more similar to one of these Life Chances Fund projects, they'll be able to see, like, OK, what's a reasonable expectation for how well this project will support people? How how many outcomes can I expect to achieve in my first year? What's a sensible outcome measure? Where have they needed to change over time? So by um, kind of crowding in more of that insights, um, we hope that the, the evaluation isn't just sort of stuck in reports, but it has the ability to be interrogated and questioned um, by different partners. And then I think that relates to this kind of third part around local level adaptation, because 
the outcomes focus in these projects means that there's an awful lot of um, learning and adaptation going on within project teams themselves. So just creating a space for people to come together can actually be incredibly dynamic, um, you know, an area for knowledge exchange. Um, so just by trying to create kind of forums and networks to connect the project partners. I, I am so impressed with your uh, ability to get that data online and early for September as well. So we look forward to to seeing that for this one. That's quite a feat. I've got some questions coming in, um, Eleanor, because we're getting close to, to time and uh, I think everyone recognises it's quite quite early and what a way to start off your, your week over there in the UK. A uh, question coming in, is there any sense of the commonalities in the veri verification process for outcomes and any quantification of time or effort of the government funder in the verification process? So there's uh, colleagues here have had some experience of, say, the government might be taking up to four months to verify an outcome at each, each stage. Yeah, so this is something where there does seem to be variation and um, some outcomes funds, I suppose, have, have built on the experience of previous challenges around this verification piece, um, trying to use different sources of data to verify the achievement of outcomes. Um, so one of the examples that we have is where um, both the outcomes funder and the local project teams are sharing the same platforms for exchange of um, outcomes achievement data. Uh, that might be a, a route to accelerate um, the uh, shared understanding of when outcomes have been achieved. Um, but I think that's a, that's, that can be quite a tough one. Um, so that I suppose has been the case more recently, but it's particularly appropriate where outcome measures are just observational data. But actually I think in, in the US example, where there's an expectation that payment for outcomes is made contingent on an independently conducted sort of quasi-experimental study, these things do take a long time. So there is a big lag between project implementation and the understanding of successfully achieved outcomes and the verification and the payment. And that was all built into the contract. So the expectation hasn't necessarily deviated so much from what was expected, but you've got to have quite an, a patient um, team um, needing payment there um, because it, it could take several years before those final results are verified. We've got, um, and it's a great point because we've got a couple of questions, related questions to that as well about how, when the outcomes are longer term, when exactly do you do that measurement and when are the payments actually made? And I think you've provided some interesting points there about how you work with research teams as well and how different collaborations work to actually build that trust and transparency to make that happen. Um, we've got a question as well. Um, uh, I, th I think I might need to elaborate. How do you manage the risk of hitting the target but missing the point, perhaps? Mm. Um, and uh, whilst we think about that one, another follow-up question, and this isn't uh, a stitch-up either, uh, do you see outcomes funds or contracts as a funding resource for universities to carry out applied research activities? Or have you seen any usage of research impact funds? Um and maybe that relates to as well the role of the, the GoLab in being an evaluation partner. Perhaps are you seeing other UK universities or individual academics involved perhaps uh, in that? Because I'm also curious about um, what types of organisations do you see involved in managing some of these funds uh, and then also who's involved in the evaluation? Great. Thank you. Thanks for these questions. So Lisa's question around um, hitting the target but missing the point, I think is a really important question. And um, certainly there has been a lack of flexibility in some of the contracts that we've seen um, to uh, understand whether the outcome measures are meaningful in the lives of participants and it, to understand whether social change is really happening. So I think certainly some of the older outcomes funds that had these kind of rate cards, these, these menus of very specific measures, there was little flexibility to change those. So if a metric was sort of misfiring, maybe the data requirements were too onerous and, you know, that, that 
it ultimately wasn't doing a good job of guiding service delivery or um, detecting change, there wasn't really anything to be done about it. You just had to live with that. And you could either give up on that particular outcome measure and, and no payments would be made against it, or or you sort of just humor it. And and it and it's and it's misfiring for the life of the project, which I think is a pretty dispiriting and concerning place to be. So I think in order to really make the most of this kind of learning environment, we do need to think quite carefully about adaptive um, partnerships where the outcome measures maybe can be reflected on at specific points in time. Um, so increasingly, the projects that we're seeing come come through with an expectation of revisiting the measures exactly to ask, <laughs> are we hitting the target but missing the points? Um, but that actually calls for quite a lot of um, reflexivity on the part of the team who are administering the outcomes funds. Um, and there are real questions, like that, there are some tough decisions to be made there. Are we just softening up the measures to make it easier for project partners to get paid? Or is this a, a really well considered and authentic way of getting a better understanding and therefore something that should be supported? So I think the, there's some technical requirements around these things in terms of being able to pay for outcomes, but also the space for relationships to really understand how is implementation going? Do we need to revisit? Is this outcome measure working in the way that we had hoped? And, and having teams with the time and capacity to have those difficult conversations, I think is an important part of the outcomes fund agenda too. Um, and then this question around university involvement, uh, there's certainly been um, probably more uh, research than you would expect, given the size of these projects linked to outcomes funds and the, the outcomes based projects that results. And in part, I think that's because it uh, tends to be quite a data rich landscape compared to more conventionally funded social programs. Um, and I think also often some of the hype around the initiatives can mean that there's sort of more eyes on these things in terms of kind of research and scholarship than might otherwise be the case. Um, which I which I, I still think is a good thing because it's enabling us to learn about quite a fast moving and changeable um, set of concepts and whether they're capable of improving um, social programs. Um, in terms of the sort of the, the management role, that's been performed by a range of different organisations. Sometimes it's been government teams who have take, taken on the kind of the operational functioning of the outcomes fund. Elsewhere, there have been extra partners like grant management special I mean it shouldn't necessarily be grant management but actually sometimes government partners really struggle to pay for outcomes um and so having um specialist um sort of fund administrators to implement the the, the fund has been seen as a helpful um a helpful approach um Universities have sometimes, like ours, been involved across the research and development um, piece for a project. And then other times it happens at a much more local level. So where you have a project that's very specific on a social issue, bringing an academic specialist to help think through, you know, how will we understand whether this project is really working? So it's, sometimes it's done um, much sort of less formally and at a local project level too. Now, I'm conscious of the time and I don't want this to sound like an MBA class, but do you have a couple of takeaways for us here at Down Under in Australia about overall the insights about what we need to be thinking about as we have our national conversation and interest around the, the government's announced outcomes fund? So I, I think um, just going back to the kind of where are they working best piece, this is not a question of a kind of single best approach, but I think having a conversation about the aspirations for the outcomes fund and then trying to work so that there's coherence between the design choices and the different missions. If this is really about cutting down on those transaction costs and a replicable model, there should be much more emphasis on templating, sharing standardized and verified outcome measures, trying to harmonize and ease the burden as much as possible around that kind of data collection and verification piece. That's a kind of kind of oiling the wheels logic uh, to a particular outcomes fund design. If the question is more, 
catalyzing a landscape of different outcomes funders, encouraging different government partners and philanthropists to think about outcomes, then inviting others into the process of developing and designing these outcomes-based projects seems to be much more compelling. You're drawing partners closer to do some of that work. Maybe the transaction costs go through the roof, but you've brought partners together to work differently. That's a very different logic. And, and so for me, I think being quite candid about the mission and the purpose of the Outcomes Fund can be a, a useful way to unlock some of those design questions. Um, and actually, I think that's something that there's enormous dissonance uh, in some of the UK projects between the aspired for um, promises of the Outcomes Fund and the design, and where I think we'd be really keen to try and get into more of a conversation about uh, maybe how to navigate some of those tensions. Well, um, we'll have to leave it there, Eleanor, because I'm conscious of uh, the time getting away. We have a lot, uh, several more questions through, which we might try and uh, address actually offline and add that to the website. So I wanted to say thank you so much for providing some insights about what's happening in the UK, but also globally as we have our national conversation as well. We really look forward to continuing the conversation and the collaboration and sharing what we're seeing here and also learning more, especially when it comes out in September too, about the Life Chances Fund too. Um, we've got our website there um, on the screen, you can see we're also pointing to the work of the Go Lab, of course, in that as we're pulling together what is the definition and what are these different design options too. So please have a look at the screen there. Thank you to everyone for joining us today as well for this conversation. We will send you a link to the recording of the conversation today. I'd encourage you as well to sign up to the Centre for Social Impacts newsletter as well that comes out each month. It's not just news about us, but the social purpose sector more broadly as well. And we'll certainly highlight some of the Go Lab's fantastic work. Um, and Eleanor, a final uh, good luck for the semi-final on Wednesday as well. Not too much luck. but Looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for your time and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thanks so much, Danielle. It's been a great conversation. Thank you.